So here's one more quick example on how to calculate free float and total float, also known as free slack and total slack. The words float and slack are interchangeable, they mean the same thing, but total float is different from free float. Uh, so in this video, one more example on how to calculate the total float and free float for the various activities in a project um, on a PDM network diagram. So by now, if you've been watching these tutorials, you already know how to draw the PDM network diagram for this. So let's go ahead and do that. It looks just like this. Then we can do the forward pass to find the early start and early finish of each activity. Then we can do the backwards pass to find the late start and late finish of each activity. Now we can calculate the total float of each activity. We'll write that above each node just like this, and I'm going to drop the TF for each node and I'll just write the value, but that's where it'll be located. Uh, if you recall from the previous videos, we can find the total float by subtracting early finish from the late finish or early start from the late start. This way would be called the start float and doing it with these numbers would be called the finish float, but it's actually the same number regardless of which one you do. For example, zero minus zero is zero. 3 minus 3 is 0. So I'll write the total float of activity A just right above it. Next up we'd have 3 minus 3 is 0, or you could do 7 minus 7 to get 0. Total float of activity B is 0. Total float of activity D you can see is also 0. Total float of activity G is 0, and total float of activity H is 0. You're going to see in a minute that these will form a critical path. Uh, but let's look at these other three nodes. Activity C the total float of activity C would be 9 minus 3, that's 6. Or conversely, you could get it from here, 11 minus 5 is 6. So C's total float is 6. Activity E, 12 minus 6 is 6. Or also, you could see 11 minus 5 is 6. So its total float is 6. Activity F, we have 16 minus 7. So that gives us a total float of 9. You can also see that here from the 14 minus 5. That would also give you a 9. And then just by inspection, you can look and see with each node that has a total float of zero will form a critical path, so let's outline it here in red. Now, the last thing to do is find the free float of each activity, and we'll write the free float beneath each node, just like we've been doing in the previous videos. And if you recall, the free float is the minimum early start of all of the successors of a given activity, minus the early start of the given activity, minus the given activity's duration. So for example, for activity A, the minimum early start of all of its successors, we have two options. We have three or we have three. So we have to pick three. So three minus zero minus three, its free float is going to be zero. Another thing to notice is the free float is always equal to or less than the total float. It can never be more than the total float. So right away, if you're on the critical path, you know that the free float will definitely be zero for all of these. But I'll just show you a few examples. Uh, just to prove that. For example, for B, it's free float. We would take the earliest start of its successor, so it would be 7 minus its own early start minus its own duration. So 7 minus 3 minus 4, that gives us 0. Same thing goes for activity D. We would have 12 minus 7 minus 5, gives us 0. And the free float of activity G, we would have 16 minus 12 minus 4, gives us 0. If you're curious about where that came from, uh, we talked about that whole formula just in the previous video. And let's not forget activity H. It doesn't have any successors, but its total float is zero, so its free float can't be greater than zero, so its free float is zero. So let's look at these guys now that aren't on the critical path. So activity C, it has two successors, so we have to choose the smallest early start of its successors. And it just turns out again that they both have the same early start of five. So then we subtract, we have 5 minus 3 minus 2, so we find that C's free float is 0. Now for activity E, we'll take 12 minus 5 minus 1, so it has a free float of 6. And then for activity F, we can go 16 minus 5 minus 2, and we'll get a free float of 9. And if you recall, so the difference between total float and free float. So total float was the amount of time any given activity can be delayed without affecting the end date of the project. For example, anything on the critical path, if you delayed it by anything, even if you delayed one of these activities just by one day, you would extend the entire duration of the project by one day. Let's look at the activity D, for example. 
if we actually delayed D so it finished on the on 13 instead of 12, well then we have to bring that 13 here, then we'd add 4 and we'd actually end on 17 with G, and then activity H would have to start on 17 and then would end on 20. So we would actually increase the duration of the whole project by 1 if we increased any of these activities or delayed any of these activities by one day. Um, for one of these guys that's not on the critical path, um, for example, activity E, we have six days that we can delay this by before it would affect the end date of the project. Imagine if you delayed it for less than six days, or even up to six days. Uh, you would, If you delayed it by six days, instead of having the earliest start of five, you would start at 11, and then it would be one day you would end on 12, you would bring this 12 up here, you wouldn't affect the start date of G, and then therefore G would still end on 16, and you wouldn't affect the end date of H. The free float in this case for node E, or activity E, is also 6, because if you recall, the free float is the amount of time you can delay an activity by without affecting the earliest start of any of its successors. So imagine if you delayed E by anything, like 6 days or less, as long as you're not finishing E after this 12 here, imagine if you finished on 11 or even 12, you would bring the 12 up and you're not going to affect the earliest start that G can start on. However, if you delayed E by seven days, then you would be affecting the earliest start of G. So that's why the free float is only six here. Um, so the activity F, it has a total float and a free float of nine, so same kind of reasoning here. But activity C has a total float of six, meaning that you could delay activity C by up to six days without increasing the duration of the project. But if you delayed C by any amount of time, even if it was one day, you would affect the earliest start of at least one of its successors. You can see here, if you maybe started C on day four, then you would finish on day six, and then you would be affecting these early starts because they wouldn't be able to start on uh, day five, they'd have to start on day six again. So that's why activity C has a free float of zero.